Yeah, we, we had a little, uh, what was your worst job uh, that you had as a teenager, your toughest job kind of thing that we did earlier in the week? You may have heard that in the promo or not. So I want to ask my first guest, Senator Jason Barrett. Good morning, JB. Good morning. What was the toughest job as a kid you had in the summers or whatever? That's that's a difficult question. Or worst. I don't well, care how so you want to Well, so I spent most of the summers with my parents working with my grandparents. So who didn't make me do anything that I didn't want to do? Because so, they're grandparents. <laughs> right, because they're grandparents. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, but my first actual real job uh, at 15 was in a bowling alley. So Pin setter? Uh, I did work. Well, it, I was, I'm a little too young to, to actually be a pin setter, but... Uh, uh, I did uh, work behind the, the the lanes and on the machines and stuff as a as a 15 and 16 year old that probably violated OSHA, but they let me do it. So tell me about the shoe rental. I didn't have well. Um, it's disgusting. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. Think about that concept for a moment. Yeah. Of course it is. Yeah. Uh, I didn't uh, partake in any of that. They didn't uh, uh, allow me to work uh, with the customers. That much. <laughs> Uh, they put me back there fixing machines and getting dirty and uh -huh. crawling around on machines and under the pin setters and that type of thing. So, Think about that concept that you had to sell to people to make a bowling alley successful. you got to have special shoes, which nobody would buy because you don't need that kind of a shoe for anything else that you do in life. And you're going to just keep on putting your feet in the same shoes somebody else put their feet in over and over again every day but they have that spray i'm not sure what that spray was no, but they know the yes, right. <laughs> my dad in the yeah. 1930s my dad's early job i think he was 13 14 years old was a, at a bowling alley but he was a manual pin setter they didn't have the right. the thing that came down so he'd actually put the pins up and and some of the local miscreants would bowl while he was setting up the pins <laughs> and that would always lead to a fight but your dad would charge down yeah. there and fight the person <laughs> yeah. the bowling ball yeah. the pins that's a tough job right there. That would be. It's scary. You know, you're setting pins and brawling how many times a day? Because that yeah. could literally happen every time someone throws a ball. Yeah, well, so hopefully an adult steps in and says, hey, you know, come on, stop that. Yeah. Uh, so that, we, got some, we got some fun answers on that. Uh, Patrick Morrissey was a professional tennis referee. He got yelled at by uh, Jimmy Connors and John McEnroe. Oh, so he was high end. Oh, yeah. He made it all the way to, the, you know, the top chair. Wow. You know, he, he got yelled at by some of the best tennis players who ever lived. If you're going to get yelled at, you want it to be by John McEnroe because he, he did it well. He really tore India. He didn't stop until he had you pretty much gored uh, and, and filleted. Uh, was the hay job your worst there, Matt? I mean, My, do you have something worse? I, what do you mean by worse? Like, like the I, toughest, to have a job. most difficult? The toughest job, I actually worked construction, putting down industrial flooring in college. Not yeah. every summer, but I did it at the end of my college college career to save money for law school mm -hmm. and it paid good money back then and i knew the owners they were real kind to me so they would uh, make sure i had enough work so i could buy my laptop or pay rent in law school and it was but the work was tough it was real tough I mean, sure you're mixing concrete by hand pouring it and then putting an epoxy coating on it in in high density areas where you have a lot of stuff that hits the ground so it won't the, you know rot the concrete mm -hmm. so i'm talking about like chicken plants and those smell good those are it's awful yeah it's yeah. it's very hard and the, the 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 people that work those jobs um were pretty rough and mm -hmm. um it was just, i saw some stuff i probably didn't <laughs> need to be exposed to at a young age I, one job where i was replacing filters you know you go into a classroom i worked at my high school the summer i graduated so like you know custodial for the summer months and one of the jobs I had was in each classroom, there's, you know, like a heating air conditioning system if you, you know, for, the, for the wing that had AC at that time. So you'd have to go in, and the bottom of these units was a filter that was probably, I don't know, three feet long, and it fit over this long oval, looked like almost like a racetrack, but much thinner, so it could fit into a, a unit. And it was fiberglass. And there were no precautions that I was told to take while changing these three foot long, six inch wide fiberglass filters that slid over this frame. And after doing that for about an hour with short sleeves on, I just like that fiberglass gets in your skin. I did that all day long. And I, you can't imagine in the summer being covered with fiberglass cuts all over your arms, not to mention how much of that dust you breathe in or whatever. I had to do that for an entire week till all the filters were changed in the school. I can't imagine asking somebody today to do that 
without any kind of precautions? You should you should have the skin covered. That, definitely. Well, the next day I wore a long sleeve shirt. I am. Um, Rob, you know this, but I, a lot of people don't know that my dad used to own a pest control company, mm-hmm. and I worked uh, with him for a number of years. Uh, you were a bug killer. I, I know, and so. Uh, there were so many times down in crawl spaces and, and you're crawling across, you know, the plastic and you feel a snake crawl underneath <laughs> of you. You look at the top of the, uh, the, at the sill plate, at the top of the, the, the block foundation, and you can see eyes staring at you from rats. And so, uh, but now, now anytime there's any bug anywhere in our house, immediately it's a catastrophe and summer requires me to take care of the problem now. Not two minutes from now, but now. Uh, so, so you're still doing that? Still doing that, yeah. 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 See, now that's the story that I wanted. Yeah. Not, well, not you said my the grandparents love me. Well, well, right. And so I, I worked in a bowling alley, and then I worked for my dad. And at that point, I realized that I'm only working for myself from now on. Uh-huh. Uh, and that now I'm in the Senate and I have 105,000 bosses instead of just one. So. And, and let's get into that now, because you're, be, you're about to head back for interim sessions on uh is the senate going into they are uh i had uh an out of town uh vacation planned uh since november so i will you not, will not be gone. i will not be there for i believe it's just sunday monday sunday monday tuesday I right so yeah uh, this is probably my first interims in wow i would a, a number of years that I'm, I'm not able to attend but do you know what's on the agenda uh, the, I've looked at a few of them. I, I spoke yesterday with uh, Delegate David Kelly, who is the uh, – I'm going to screw the name of the committee up, uh, even though I'm the chair of it on the Senate side uh, – It <laughs> jails and uh, prisons, I mm-hmm. believe, because we've had so many different uh, committees uh, related to that topic, interim committees, select committees. So uh, I believe it's jails and prisons. Uh, I serve as the, as the chair of that committee. Uh, in the Senate now, I was just appointed that a week or so ago. So I, I talked to David a little bit yesterday about some of the things they're going to discuss. Uh, obviously, uh, as it relates to the National Guard, uh, men and women uh, in the in in our facilities, uh, the job they're doing, uh, the associated costs with that. Uh, I, I'm sure the topic of of pay raises for uh, correction officers will come up. One of the things that I think the committee is going to look at. Uh, moving forward in interims throughout the year uh, is is who should pay uh, or who should help pay uh, the jail cost and, and should should some arresting authority have some skin in the game not just the county uh, should municipalities um, uh, have skin in the game and, and pay the first night or number of nights one of the bills that we passed this year that included um, as Bill Stubblefield calls it the convoluted formula uh, to to de- determine um, the the actual um, per diem cost uh, for the county also included um, the first night uh, that the municipality if there were if there was an agreement between the municipality and the county uh, for the for the municipality to pay the first night so the first 40 you know it just depends on uh, you know based on the formula 40 to 50 dollars and it's, it's completely permissive so I can't imagine that any city is going to volunteer mm-hmm. uh, to pay a bill that they don't necessarily have to. What is the logical argument for the local, for the municipality, local municipalities not to pay their share? Well, you'd have to ask the municipality that. Uh, but I, I think what they would say is, look, um, that they're put in, you know, a regional jail, uh, that the magistrates um, obviously play a role in. Uh, what where bail is set, how quickly somebody gets out, and it's out of their hands. Uh, and so you might as well set it for a long, you know, a high bail or uh, put him in for a long time because you got no well, skin the, in that the, game, the, right? The, the magistrate determines that at the locality. The, the ma- yes, the county okay. magistrate. Who, who owns the prisons? Well, the regional jails are owned by the state uh, that were that were taking over taken over from you know the old county jails that were clearly inefficient. And counties couldn't afford. So, you know, I think that I don't think it's unreasonable to ask municipalities to have either pay the first night or the first couple of nights. Now, they're certainly going to, to fight against that. That's OK. But um, um, they're they're arresting folks and, and putting people in jail. And um, just as deputy sheriff, the, you know, the, the sheriff's department is in, in the county has, is on the hook for the for that bill for that. Well, we have one here in, in Martinsburg. The county's on the hook for the state police, the municipalities. That's right the sheriff's deputies every arrest that's made 
Who's on the hook for that? I'm sorry. The, the, the county. county. The county pays the regional jail bill. How many regional jails are there? Well, 10 or 11. Yeah. I mean, every county Ten. goes to, you know, if someone is arrested in any of the 55 counties, there's a regional jail that that, that, that person that's arrested will go to. Uh, and that county pays the regional jail for that particular inmate. So it's not it's not where the it's not the county where the jail is located that pays all the bills. Right. It's it, it's the it's the county that that arrested them. And, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Right. Never mind. Do cities deal with the cost? Does, does Martinsburg share any of the regional cost? No. For the ERJ, they they do pay some. They do. In, in some specific incidents, they do pay some. If there was something where they were arrested for a municipal offense, or right, ordinance. right. If it's if it's a strictly municipal offense, but but most municipalities, when the when the city police are arresting someone, they're gonna, you know, even if you're violating a municipal ordinance, you're gonna also get cited for uh, a violation of something in state code. So the the county then pays the the per diem cost for that particular inmate. Does do the and I'm not suggesting Martinsburg does that. I'm just saying that goes mm -hmm. on across before, <laughs> well, before the mayor happened, starts blowing They've the been up. accused of it. They, what, the, the, there's a lot of – people will say that the municipalities will uh, take the low-level offenses like the speedings and where they know that there's not jail time attached, mm -hmm. not, and they will, they will ch run that through municipal court, and then the stuff that's going to require jail, they'll run it through state court. Right. And so they're, they're – you know, that's an argument – for municipalities having to pay their share that they're they're skimming the cream off the top yes i've, I've heard that accusation yeah right uh staying on the jail mm -hmm. subject here let's talk about the national guard i'm told the federal government pays 82 percent of national guard wages so if we have national guardsmen at the jails providing whatever limited security roles they're allowed to fill it is to the state's advantage to not necessarily be in a hurry to alleviate that issue because the feds are paying 82% of that cost as opposed to the state paying 100% of the cost of having state employees in the federal or sorry in the uh, in the regional jails. Well, I mean the, the fact that we have national guards men and women in our our prisons now has has cost the state 20 million dollars. Um, I don't know that that's that, that we're somehow saving money because the federal government is paying these national guards. I, I don't, I don't know that that's accurate. Um, and, and if it is accurate, I can't imagine the federal government's going to allow that to go on very long, mm -hmm. uh, because that's not the job of, of these uh, national guardsmen and women. And I think it's also a point, I think you kind of hinted about it is, you know, there, there's this, uh, kind of assumption that these folks from the National Guard are having direct contact with inmates, and that's not the case. They are doing some tasks there, but but they are not um, in a position or in positions uh, where they are, are interacting, um, you know, uh, directly one on inmates. one directly yeah. with inmates. Right. So those, that is still being done by um, our correction officers that we have very limited number of and, and struggle to recruit and retain. What are the plans to fix this issue? Other than at some point we know the National Guard troops have to leave the jails, but I presume because it's an emergency situation, they can't leave until we have enough employees. Sure. Well, I think the, the governor has declared a state of emergency for, for that right. particular issue. Uh, I think you know, certainly we have to look at, at uh, something as it relates to pay. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've been doing our best to try to keep flatline budgets as best we can. Uh, giving pay raises to, to state employees kind of across the board. Uh, we've done the largest uh, tax cut in the history of the state. Uh, all those things cost a lot of money. And, and so I think we just have to look at, uh, and, and, and clearly doing a pay raise for correction workers uh, is something that is an ongoing expense. It's not, a, it's not a one time expense. So, you know, it's something that you have to be able to budget for uh, moving forward. So. Uh, I really think that, you know, if, if we're going to do that, and, and clearly we need to, to do a pay raise for correction workers, that, that there needs to be a locality pay piece to that. And I know that's going to be another fight again. But um, That brought a wry smile from your face. Yeah, well, I, just because I was picturing some of the, the debate and discussion that goes on with that issue in the House of Delegates that I no longer have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But, <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's... You know, I, I don't think that we can let up, and, and this may be another one that, that we we're not we don't win on the issue of locality pay with correction workers, but we're gonna I'm gonna at least 
continue that conversation. Is the lack of corrections workers a relatively recent phenomenon, or has it been this way for a decade? I don't believe it's been a decade. I, I believe it's been the past two to three years. Co sure. Post-COVID. That's right. And why? What would, do you have an idea of what the trigger was? We, we went from having being pretty stable to big emergency. Well, I think there are a lot of uh, other job opportunities across the state that, that you know, as we continue to – uh, to attract business uh, into West Virginia and and there's employment opportunities um, as a state we have to continue to give pay raises at that point pay raises to our state employees because it's great that we're bringing in jobs and we want to do that uh, but at the same time you're bringing in competition uh, for 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 employees uh, and that that impacts um, you know the state as well as as an employer so uh, it, it is a uh, a dangerous job uh, it, it is a very demanding job uh, and it doesn't pay all that well. Is the crisis unique to West Virginia, no. or is this across all states? No, it, it, states? it's it's. I don't want to say it's across all states, but it is across many states. Okay. Uh, it is it is a it is a national problem. It's a hard job. Okay. You know, I, let me ask you, Matt Harvey, this question because I have for the longest time, and since you're in charge of the committee in regards to jails and prisons, Jason. Uh, we put too many people in prison. I think some of that was was brought about because we had uh, private enterprise prisons out there that uh, basically they're for-profit for prisons that needed to be filled, right? Uh, so we were jailing too many people. I think prison should be there for violent offenders. Everybody else who's not is an expense to the taxpayers, and they're not necessarily a threat to the person walking the street, right? So we need to revise who we put in prison and the reasons why we put people in prison. I don't think everybody should go to prison just because they're guilty of a crime. If you're not violent, you should be under home arrest. That way we don't need as many prison guards and we don't have as giant of an expense on our prison bills. Your thoughts as a prosecuting attorney? Well, first of all, we do not have for-profit prisons in West Virginia. So there, you can't, I don't want people to think that there's some sort of motivation by a judge. They're getting a campaign contribution from someone we've seen in other states. Um, the but, but you admit it did happen in other states, though. Is that I, what you're saying? As I, we've I've, seen in other states, I believe that I've read that that, yeah. that there are that there are problems with for-profit prisons. It puts a pressure on. You've got this many beds. You got to fill them to to you incentivize it. There's an economic component to it. We don't have that in West Virginia. Our jails are. You know, that's one thing that we we're doing right. If you're it, um, also, the, the legislature has done many things to, to keep people out of prison that don't, or in jail that don't need to be there by, by reforming the bail laws to where we have presumptive PRs and on most nonviolent misdemeanor offenses, there, it's presumed that you're going to get a PR bond unless the magistrate makes a deviation from that. Um, so that's, that's helped keep people out. Um, Look, I review our jail. We get a we get a weekly report of all the inmates that are in in Jefferson County, and I look at that and and I to find if there's someone that doesn't need to be there. Occasionally, some something will pop up, but it is violent. Uh, you know the nature of the crime; they need to be there, um, and it's people that have had a couple of opportunities to do the right thing, and they haven't. You know, there's a capius, there's a, there's a, they've revoked their probation, they've failed to appear for court, and there's a capius out, a warrant. So, you know, th those are the people that I see that are in the, the local jail. And I know a lot, a lot of other prosecutors are looking at those lists and doing the same thing on a constant basis. So um, I think it's a deeper problem than, uh, than maybe we're putting too many people in jail. We have too many reasons to put people in jail that's based on, this fentanyl epidemic that's mm -hmm. just destroying uh, America, quite frankly. Oh, it certainly is. I mean, in, in, in that case, jail is a life-saving measure. If you've got this unknown, unregulated quantity of fentanyl that, that you don't know is going to pop up in this pill or, or th this illicit drug that you're buying, the only way that you can stop, you know, protect people from themselves is put them in jail. So, so it, it, is, it is a... Well, you're talking about putting hold. addicts in jail? Well, people that break the law. Yeah, sometimes that's the only way that, that keeps. Sometimes that keeps them safe. Is the it, law being the act of buying narcotics, is and, it, and the, committing the other crimes to to purchase the, narc, the narcotics. Okay. It's it's usually not just the, they're they're just using. They're doing other things as well. 
But I mean, to raise the money to buy the drugs. Yeah. Okay. And look, I'm all for alternative sentences. Mm -hmm. I've I've pushed them. I've supported them. All of our programs and our. I, I could, you know, I look at Jefferson County. I don't think we've got too many people in jail. I think we've got the right people in jail, because we, because we pay attention, and our judges do a fantastic job of paying attention to what they're doing, and we have good defense attorneys advocating on behalf of their clients. So, back to Senator Jason Barrett here. Uh, we've got a situation where you've got a l low pay at a place where fewer people want to work. That seems to be a difficult problem to solve, even with slightly higher pay, because if you're making what is, what's a typical prison guard make? Twenty five, thirty? I believe it's thirty at this point. Thirty? Okay, that's you know right. you, that's still not enough to make me want to go in and deal with what I got to deal with in a in a prison filled with, as Matt said, and mostly that's, violent that's people. Starting pay. I mean, that's that's where you start at. But to your point, you're right. Yeah. So I mean, you'd have to have a pretty big jump to make that suddenly become an appealing place to be. Fifty thousand? You don't have to jump at twenty thousand dollars, maybe to get it. I mean, I think you can start at Procter and Gamble now at like forty-four or something like that. Right, and and, and, and get vacation think, and benefits and all that good stuff. Sure, and and but when you look in the southern part of the state or other or or the middle of the state, really, that we often don't talk about, where there's not a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's not a Procter and Gamble to go work for forty-four thousand dollars a year and a couple of weeks vacation. I mean, that that just doesn't exist in a lot of the states. So. You know, a thirty or forty thousand uh, uh, dollar annual salary in a lot of parts of the state is is a very livable wage. And clearly, it's not here. Uh, that that well, let me back up. That it's a livable wage. I mean, you you can get by making that. I don't, I'm not trying to put anybody down in that salary range. I'm, I'm just saying that um, it's difficult to attract employees at a dangerous job at mm -hmm. that at that salary. Which rate. is my point. Right. Right. So how do you solve that problem? That seems like it's intrinsically unsolvable. Well, and that's why so many states are, are dealing with it. It's not just a West Virginia problem, but uh, there are people out there. There are a lot of jobs out there that, that Rob, you and I wouldn't do that, that's too difficult for us to do or something that we don't have a skill set for or don't have a passion for that other people do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, uh, wouldn't be a, a radio host because they're scared of the microphone and don't have the skill set and there's like there's no way i'm doing that job or they have common sense and to know <laughs> how to do this <laughs> in studio with new york times best-selling author john gilstrap jefferson county prosecuting attorney matt harvey and senator jason barrett who yesterday was at shepherd university in the stubblefield institute for the discussion of campus carry which passed this year jason tell me about that so about a week ago, I received an invitation uh, along with all the other Eastern Panhandle legislators to attend uh, the Stubblefield uh, Institute, uh, the uh, Campus Self-Defense Act, uh, a campus conversation. Uh, and so I was, to be honest, I was a little concerned um, when I received the invitation. I uh, actually called up uh, Ashley Hurst, who is the director at the Stubblefield Institute, and just wanted to make sure that this was going to be something where both sides uh, were heard on the issue because, you know, the assumption that you make um, when talking about campus carry um, on a college campus, uh, that the, the overwhelming um, uh, feelings on the on the campus carry, at least from uh, from faculty and staff and the administration and and you know I think a lot of students is that it's going to be negative and I just wanted to make sure that. This was something that, that both sides were going to be uh, represented on. And so they had a panel discussion uh, last night with uh, a couple of students, uh, counselor, um, uh, general counsel, uh, Alan Perdue, who d really did a nice job of outlining uh, what the bill does and doesn't do. Uh, the vice president uh, uh, was on the, the panel as well to, to discuss uh, a task force that's, that uh, Dr. Hendricks says, President Hendricks has put into place to, to ensure that uh, the students are, are aware of what exactly uh, Senate Bill 10 means to their campus, uh, how they can implement um, the, the, the things outlined in Senate Bill 10. So it was really a good discussion. It was more of, a, of an opportunity for us to listen more than, than speak, but uh, uh, which I'm always happy to do. And I think it's important, you know, as a legislator to go into uh, to environments um, that, that you know that overwhelmingly the, the folks there are going to, to disagree with you. But but I really want to give credit to the, the Stubblefield Institute for, for really taking uh, an emotionally driven issue 
uh, and really handling that in, in the most professional way possible, I think, uh, with, again, having both sides. Um, there was no heated discussion at all. Everybody, you know, on the panel was was able to uh, to give their uh, opinions uh, as to why they thought it was a, a good or bad idea. There were there were questions from the audience uh, that really sparked a, a great conversation, and I'm I'm glad that I was able to attend. Uh, and I think there were a lot of things that uh, that the students and, and the folks at the at the university really were unclear uh, and just need some some clarification on what what is allowed uh, what's not allowed and really what is the law now and and there were a few students that that sat behind me um uh, kind of in the auditorium or in the room there and, and i had several there were a, a couple of points in the night where uh the audience was allowed to to kind of have a discussion in small groups among themselves and you know there was uh times really in the beginning where um, they were unaware that that really all this bill changes is uh, the the ability for the university uh, to to implement a disciplinary action um, if you're caught carrying uh, a firearm and, and currently that's you know it's, it's perfectly legal right now for someone to be on the Shepherd campus uh, as long as it's legal for them to own and possess the firearm it's it's legal uh, for them to, to possess the firearm on, on the college campus now uh, the problem becomes for the student is if uh, the university is made aware of it that they can uh, have a disciplinary action taken against that student. So, you know, you have visitors there that I'm sure uh, at times are, are carrying, and 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 really what the bill does is to say that uh, that they cannot offer disciplinary action for anyone that has a concealed carry permit uh, through the state of West Virginia or or a state that that West Virginia recognizes uh, that concealed carry permit. Uh, there are some exclusions as to to where the the university will still be able to uh, restrict uh, firearms uh, in. So, uh, it it really I think was an opportunity to to clarify exactly what the bill does and doesn't do and i think it was a great conversation john this we're not the shepherd is not the first university to have this campus carry be approved um of historically has it been a problem have we had a problem with with kids shooting each other in on campus carry? The, that's the big fear right is is it going to turn into the wild west and that's just never happened has it it has not i mean i believe there are 13 states that that allow campus carry uh that prohibit um the universities from um issuing some type of disciplinary action on students that that lawfully carry firearm on campus and and, and it, what the bill also does is it says that if you um if uh if the university uh wants to uh have certain areas where they you know or buildings where they they want to prohibit firearms that they then have to have armed security and they have to have uh metal detectors to ensure safety and that's what the the real reason for the bill is that uh there are there are two ways to look at it we're going to allow students to protect themselves and if the university wants to restrict that then the university is going to take the responsibility of protecting the students and the kids can be armed in classrooms correct see I, my son was at virginia tech for the virginia tech shootings and lost a couple of friends there he, he turned out fine and ever since then you know i have been in, infuriated about the the barring of of handguns in in the classrooms that was one guy with one pistol and he killed 32 people and then himself just one at a time if if any if anybody could have shot back mm -hmm. he at least they would have had a, had a, well, a chance so i i personally think this is common sense legislation well and i think if there's the the threat of someone shooting back that, that maybe the, the yeah. person you know because these gun free zones are really just uh, uh, folks are just a bunch of sitting ducks mm -hmm. um with the you know without the ability to protect themselves and uh one of the students that was on the panel uh last night uh she was a, very much an advocate uh for the ability to carry and she said she was absolutely going to and and she really did a nice job i think of in, in a in an environment where you know i think there were about eight people on the panel um some of them were very openly uh, opposed to campus carry and but the you know you could get the undertones from the entire room that that's where most folks were but she, but she really uh stood up and did a, a really nice job of, of defending why now she is i'm gonna she, she rattled this off a little quick for me but i believe she is uh ranked ninth nationally for females under the age of 20 uh, with a nine millimeter 
Wow. Um, and so she, I got to talk to her a little bit. Her and her parents were there last night as well, uh, you know, to talk about her advocacy for, you know, the ability to, to, to bear arms and, and protect herself. So there are a lot of students there that I think that are kind of in that position uh, on the university, but, but maybe, uh, I don't want to say fearful, but just a little leery of, of really speaking up. So I was, um, it, it was really nice to get to have a conversation with her and, and listen to her, um, you know, talk about And it's why concealed she, carry only? That's right. And you have to have a permit. Right. Now, in the state of West Virginia, uh, you can, um, you know, we have constitutional carry, so you don't have to have a permit. Uh, so in, it is still legal uh, to go to the university after this bill becomes law uh, to conceal without a permit. Uh, but the if a student or faculty does it, then the university has the ability to, to issue some disciplinary action. And are qualified adults, you know, people who are allowed to carry, the, the concealed carry in, in, in general, it's everybody, but if you have a permit, whatever the case may be, does any, does this bill affect high schools and college, uh, high schools and elementary schools where guns are not allowed on? This does not look at uh, uh, K through 12 at all. Okay. This does not permit any type of carrying on K through 12. It's, it's secondary education only. Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. The people that were that were there that opposed it in the crowd, do you, the students, do you think, um, can you speak more on, if you could tell, if, if, if their thoughts had changed or if, if they're more entrenched that they're, that they're against it? I really got the sense that, that, that folks understood that, that, that the, the people on the side of supporting Senate Bill 10 were looking to ensure safety. And I think we just have a disagreement about how we ensure safety. I, I, the folks that were there last night, uh, particularly the presenters who were opposed to Senate Bill 10, um, realized that this is the law. We're going to figure out a way to implement it, and we're going to figure out a way uh, to do the best we can to ensure safety in our campus. Uh, I, I will say that, that I mentioned that the, ta the safety task force um, was really the, the impression that I got, I think it was made fairly clear, that this task force was uh, was implemented after Senate Bill 10, and it's to, it's to deal with some of the uh, provisions of Senate Bill 10. So the university didn't have a safety task force until Senate Bill 10 passed. So, you know, that I think it's important to note, important to note that, that uh, because of Senate Bill 10 and because we're going to allow people to protect themselves, now the university has created this task force not only to look at the provisions of Senate Bill 10, but also to help ensure safety uh, in, on, that, on that campus. So if in a dorm, as a student, won't, won't they, isn't there a lockbox that they're required to keep their gun in? So the, the university has the ability in, in several situations, uh, including a dorm room, uh, to require uh, some type of locker uh, that, that they could um, make uh, they could they can make the student have lock the the firearm up at night now if you're in the, a, a dorm in the common area or the cafeteria someplace where there's um, you know a large group then, then they can't restrict carrying there but they can in in in, in the dorm rooms they can in uh, stadiums or large events with over a thousand people if there are certain labs where uh, there there's particular uh, chemicals or, or materials in, uh, they can restrict firearm carrying there. Uh, if there's uh, some type of uh, discipline, disciplinary um, board or meeting, something where a student is, is facing some type of disciplinary action or, or um, uh, hearing or procedure, then, then they can restrict uh, firearms there. So there are, there are a number of, of provisions where um, the university can can still restrict firearms. I'll read you a comment on our Facebook page, Jason from David Anderson. Campus carry, and I know you know David. Campus carry is a horrible bill. Why do we need more guns? I will not understand. Maryland is going in the opposite direction. Why the Republicans want more guns, especially on campus? We're definitely going to lose college kids to other states when we need more students. Well, it's incredibly naive to think there are not firearms on college campuses now. Uh, and again, it is perfectly legal for anyone to carry a firearm at Shepherd University or any other public institution in the state. And, and I think Shepherd uh, and Alan Perdue, who's their general counsel, did an excellent job last night of, of 
educating uh, the folks in the audience on that particular issue. Uh, that if a visitor uh, or anyone, well, uh, let's use a visitor. If a visitor goes to Shepherd right now and they have a firearm, open or concealed, that is 100% legal in the state of West Virginia. Uh, even if there is a sign posted that says no firearms, even if you carry a firearm, you're not breaking the law. The only law that you're breaking is when they tell you to leave or to remove your firearm uh, to your car or off property, um, then if you fail to do that, then you're trespassing. Aside from that, you're not breaking any laws. Now in West Virginia, we also have uh, what we refer to as the parking lot bill really dealt with employers. If you uh, are an employee, you go to work and you leave your firearm in your car, uh, the employer cannot prevent you from doing that. Now, the employer can prevent you from bringing it in the building. That's that's their discretion. Uh, but in, on college campuses, um, it is still 100% legal right now before this law goes into effect to carry a firearm on that campus, um, whether you're a student uh, or visitor. As long as you're lawfully permitted to carry that firearm, you're allowed to do that. The, the only thing that, that this bill does is it says that the institution cannot implement disciplinary action on you for doing that if you have a concealed carry permit. Why do you suppose the timing was right this session for this to pass? It's been tried before and, and has not gotten up enough steam and momentum this time it went through. Well, I, in the past, um, when I was a member of the House of Delegates, uh, the House passed out campus carry. Um, the bill th that year died uh, in Senate Judiciary, I believe, either on a tie vote or um, it, it failed by one vote. So it was incredibly close a number of years ago, and I think that was probably 2019 off the top of my head uh, is when that happened, 2019, 20, some, somewhere along in there. Um, so I, it was very close a number of years ago. Um, you know, we, we to David's point, um, there are a bunch of Republicans in, in the legislature that want to ensure people have the right to protect themselves. So uh, I think when you have um, mega majorities the way we do, uh, bills like this pass. And, and they you, should. And you do have a mega majority, 88 to 12 it, in the House and 31 to 3 in the Senate. It just doesn't make sense that, that if you're trying to protect people from themselves that you make them more vulnerable. And so I think this, yeah, I, I, it's just a commentary on my part. I think if you are going to be shot at and you have the choice, the choice is to be able to defend yourself because I know that David's feeling on that is adding more guns to the equation just makes it more dangerous. And I suppose you can say that that's true because if there are no guns ever produced in the world, then you can't get shot. But that's not the case. So what are you going to do to defend yourself? And we see, I don't know how many there have been already this year. And terms of mass shootings it's a problem that uh, right now is worse it's not getting better and I know there's been protests the legislature should do something state legislatures should ban uh, uh, quote unquote assault rifles okay but they're still guns and you can you can ban new ones from being made and purchased but there's still ones that exist and then there's, there's another 300 million guns well, out there that aren't assault rifles and an assault rifle is it's a cosmetic thing. It is. You know, it has nothing to do with, with what type of bullet fi it fires or anything else. There's a logical disconnect that doesn't get enough exposure, I don't think. When somebody says, why do you need to have a gun in the grocery store? The response is, if I thought I needed a gun in the grocery store, I wouldn't go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Right? The idea is, if it, it's just, it, why do I need a smoke detector? I'm not going to set a fire in my house. I have a smoke detector in case there's a fire. I wear seat belts, not because I'm going to go run into a wall. I wear seat belts in case something bad happens. And that's what, that's what carrying firearms and protecting oneself is all about. And it's, it's not about inciting violence. It's about protecting yourself against violence that likely will never come, I hope. If a fire starts, you'd better have water. Yeah. Or foam. As a firefighter, I didn't want you to correct me before I finished that sentence. <laughs> you know, and, and the university still has the ability to restrict firearms in any of those buildings, provided that they have metal detectors and armed uh, security. And, and again, it comes down, why it was so easy for me to vote for it is, uh, is because, because that language is in there, you're either going to, we're either going to allow the student to protect themselves 
where the university is going to take the responsibility. And, and I think it's very clear that's what the bill does. If Shepard or any other university says, we want to limit firearms as much as possible, fine. Make the decision then to have armed security uh, and, and metal detectors in there uh, to protect the students. Did the legislature consider in any form of discussion, whether it's just like the beginning phases or anything serious, any type of funding that would allow uh, SROs at all the schools uh, that want one, or at least the ability to bring on some type of security in case an incident happens at the school. I know you guys have passed funding to help strengthen the entrances and, and such to schools, and that's that's a logical step. The next logical is to have somebody, if it's not a sheriff's deputy, somebody out front who is trained and has the ability to stop a, program, a problem from escalating. You're not talking about K through 12? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm absolutely supportive of that. There was an amendment several years ago that, that, that required um, that, uh, the SROs in all schools. Uh, I, I absolutely believe that's what we should do. Um, we, there should be an SRO at every school uh, in the state. Um, you know, you cannot walk into a government building, the, the state capitol, um, uh, the Dunn building, uh, and, and not go through uh um, or the, the judicial center. I mean, if you go th in, into the judicial center, you have to go through metal detectors. There are armed guards there. You go to the state capitol. The capitol police there are armed. They have metal detectors. So, you know, if, if we're going to provide that level of protection to politicians, we sure as hell ought to do it to students. And so, um, I, you know, I, I think that, that Berkeley County, uh, from my understanding, has, has done a pretty good job of, of ensuring that there are SROs in these schools. I know the sheriff has, has asked for more of those, uh, I believe, uh, and it's, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, having that presence uh, in the school um, is vital, uh, to I believe, to the safety of, of our students. What can the legislature do to help that happen around the state, Jason? Well, I mean, a, a lot of it comes down to, to funding. Uh, you know, I think that, that you, know, you have to look at, at uh, school boards, uh, you know, to, to try to, to make that a priority through funding. I think you have to look at, at counties, um, you know, that, that do that. The, the sheriff's department, I believe, you know, they contract with um, uh, the school board to do that at, at, I believe, a very fair rate. Um, you know, I think it comes down to, you know, who's going to pay for it. And, and I, I'm certainly um, open to, to any suggestion as to how we come up with the funds, whether that's that's part done locally, part done through the state. Um, I, I think it's incredibly important. I don't think there's anything um, really more important than the safety of our students in the classroom. John Gilstrap. I'm, I'm reading our the, the the Facebook feed here. This is this is rather hot issue. It is. Um, I, I and should be. I think West Virginia, I would tell you, one of the reasons we moved to West Virginia a year ago is for some of the rational political decisions that have been made with regard to firearms and, and what have you. The, the issue is about protecting the children from bad guys. And by children, I mean students. You know, it's my age, everybody's a child. But um, to, to take away a constitutional right or to punish a kid for the, exercising the constitutional right to carry a firearm while he's in college, which is presumed to be, I mean, history shows it's, it's, you know, a lot of bad stuff happened, a lot of these shootings happen on these kinds of campuses, to take away people's ability to protect themselves, the right that they're born with, simply because they're on a college campus makes no sense to me whatsoever. So congratulations on what you did. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Harvey. Anything else? for interims that you, that you want to talk about? Not at the moment. Um, you know, I believe that we're going to have uh, some, a special session coming up. Uh, there's been some rumor of that in May or later. So, you know, I think that's that's something that we're going to look at, whether the corrections, uh, again, is part of that. Um, you know, for interims, uh, I believe we are going to have or scheduled to have a couple of traveling interims uh, this year. Uh, May is actually supposed to be, at this point, uh, scheduled in Huntington. Uh, later in the year, I believe it's November in Wheeling. Uh, so it's incredibly beneficial uh, for me and I think a lot of other legislators uh, to go to different areas of the state, you know, to have a, a better understanding. And last year uh, we had, uh, you guys will remember, I think you had some guests on during interims uh, that were actually held uh, at Kekapin State Park. Uh, Matt, I know you remember that uh, we had uh, buses that, that, were, that took um, 
uh, legislators uh, from Morgan County to, to into Berkeley and Jefferson to, to to tour and to visit a couple of different um, uh, businesses here, some uh, some horse farms in Jefferson County and some other things. So I think it's it's really beneficial for us to do that to to just get a better understanding. You know, somebody talks to me about Logan County. Um, you know, I only know what I hear from folks in Logan County, but it, you know, I have been there and. Um, you know, you get into Southern West Virginia, Matt, I know you're from Monroe County, but there are just so many, um, there are just so, so many cultural differences and, and things that, um, you know, you look at West Virginia and say, well, it's not a very diverse state, but, but really in, in, you know, in, in some terms, uh, it is kind of diverse with, you know, the, the culture in Southern West Virginia is much different than it is here and much different yeah. than it is in, in the Northern Panhandle. Senator Jason Barrett, our guest here, final minute with, uh, with JB. The remember roads to prosperity. I do. All right. <laughs> okay. Has all that money been spent? Do you know? I, I, uh, I don't know the answer to that. All right. We uh, we've poured more highway money over the last five years into roads, and this is across the country. But I can't remember a time when the roads have been worse than they are now. And you think they're bad here? You should go to the rest yeah. of the state. The, I, and the, that's the, what they said. The roads in the Eastern Panhandle are in a better condition than they are anywhere else. Um, we our problem is we don't have enough roads, or we don't have you know enough lanes on our roads. Um, in, in some areas of the state, they're they're awful. I mean, if you've been to Morgantown, if you've been to Charleston, uh, the roads there are just are horrendous. Uh, in parts but of the why north. we passed roads to prosperity five years ago? Well, that was about building new roads, not necessarily maintenance roads. You know, maintaining roads, and 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 we've poured a, a lot of money. I, Senator Blair does a good job of of outlining the amount of uh, money that we've spent on on roads here in the past couple of years. Uh, you know, you look in the past two or three years, the cost um, you know to do uh, infrastructure upgrades as it relates to roads is is incredibly expensive. Um, there's only so much uh, manpower to go around to do it. Um, you know, we have the sixth largest highway system in a very small in the country in a very small state. So, you know, there are a lot of needs. Uh, and, and to be honest, uh, it's catching up to us. I mean, we for years and years, decades, uh, the state had neglected its roads and now it's caught up to us. And, and you know, you're do, we're doing the best we can. We we could give them we could give Department of Highways a billion dollars right now for the next fiscal year. They wouldn't be able to, to, number one, that wouldn't cover all the needs anyway, but also they couldn't get that amount of work done in a year. So, right. you know, we're, we're trying to fix a three decade long problem uh, in the matter of just a past few years. And it's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating uh, to me and everyone else. Uh, but I'll tell you, some of the roads in this state are awful. I, I went to, I was just reminded, I went to Minnesota a couple of years ago and I was in Minneapolis in an Uber driving from the airport to the hotel. And I thought, these roads are awful. I mean, I think there is a real infrastructure problem across the entire country I with agree. roads and bridges and everything else. It's it's not just uh, confined to West Virginia. It, it's everywhere. But we just poured nationally, we, we've poured billions of dollars from the COVID money and anything else that we've generated. There was the infrastructure bill uh, into roads. And, and I don't see the improvements. You know, I used to get mad at people for cruising the left lane on Interstate 81 going under this. I don't blame them now. It's the only smooth lane that you can find. You come, I come down that right lane in the morning on 81, and it's like I'm in the car with a boxer and I'm taking body blows. All the, all the way down that right lane. I don't know how the wheels haven't fallen off in everybody's car around here. I-81, should, right now, should be in the middle lane and the right lane. It should be a bunch of jacked up cars <laughs> with broken axles just clogging the highway. I don't know how any cars survive coming down that highway. Well, I mean, for you, you Maryland drivers are used to driving in the left lane going too slow anyway. So, I mean, it's not really a big deal for you guys. It's, that's kind of what you well, all that do. that was a shot. I'm sorry. <laughs> My taxes are much higher. But everybody's trying to pave roads. So, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, They're like, trying, but where is the paving? Well, billions well, of dollars doesn't get well, you as. When was the last time 81 I mean, was resurfaced since it was finished? When was the last time it was resurfaced? How about never? I mean, I think they've I patched mean, a few things here or there. Well, I mean, and, you know, my problem is that, that some of that new work is not the best craftsmanship I've seen. I mean, the, there, is, there is a... a there some at, some at of the around, original work was not the best craftsmanship well, well, sure. you've ever seen. There at the Falling Waters, the, the exit 23, when you're heading um, south, uh, and there's that there's a bridge and that... The seam. The dip. Yeah, yeah. I mean... <laughs> well, they fixed that by putting a sign up that says dip. Yeah, because that's what you want to do at 70 miles an hour. 70? Well, if you're going the speed limit, Rob, is 
Most of us do. Well, we Marylanders go 55 in that left lane. Aware. Hey, uh, thanks for coming in, Jason. Appreciate it. Thank you.